My brother Sam is dead. Chapter 3. It's a funny thing. You'd think that if there were a war going on in your own country, it would change everything. It would make your life different. You'd think that there'd be men marching and drilling and people hurrying back and forth and lots of talk about fighting, but it wasn't that way at all. It wasn't any different from usual. It was just normal. Of course there were battles. There was a battle at Bunker Hill where the Patriots massacred the British troops before they were driven off, and the rebels also took Fort Ticonderoga without much of a fight, but these battles seemed so far away. They were just things that you read about in the Connecticut Journal and other newspapers. Sometimes Father brought home um, Rivington's Gazette from Verplanks. It was a Tory paper, and it was, and he wasn't supposed to have it. It was illegal, so he kept it hidden. It made me wonder how the war was going to make us freer if you can't read any newspaper you wanted anymore. Oh, I don't mean that we, were, that we ignored the war. There was always lots of discussion about it around Reading, and sometimes people in the tavern would get into arguments over it when they'd drink too much whiskey. Once Father actually threw a man out of the tavern. He was a stranger, and I guess he didn't realize that Reading was such a Tory town because he told someone that only good lob- the only good lobster back was a dead lobster back and that King George was a great hairy fool. My father said, that's subversion, and we do not permit subversion here. The man smacked his beer mug down on the table. I thought I was among freemen, not slavies. He hardly got a word out before father jumped over to the man, jerked him out of his chair, and pushed him through the door into the mud on the street. The man lay there on his back, cursing at father, but father slammed the door and the man left, so I guess he suddenly realized that he was in Tory country. But leaving out things like that, the war didn't affect us much around Reading until in that summer of 1775, except for Sam. Sam was gone, and nobody mentioned him. Not father, not mother, not me. Father didn't mention him because he'd kicked him out, and mother and I didn't mention him because of not wanting to get father angry. For all we knew, Sam could be dead, but I didn't want to think about it, so I didn't. So that summer went along, and I lived my ordinary life, which was mostly chores all day long. Having a father who was a tavern keeper was a lot better than having a, being a farmer's son like most boys. Running a farm is terribly hard work, plowing and hoeing and milking cows and such, and being out in the fields all by yourself with nobody to talk to all day long. Being around a tavern is a lot more fun. There are people coming in and going, and a lot of them have been to big towns like Hartford or New Haven or even New York or Boston, and they have stories to tell. But still, it isn't much fun for people like Jer- as Jerry Stan- Sanford thinks. Mostly Jerry works on his uncle's farm and thinks that I have it lucky. He doesn't realize there's an awful lot of wood to cut to keep the fireplace going for cooking and a lot of water to come up from the well if there isn't anything else to do. They're scrubbing the wood floors, washing the windows, and keeping everything clean generally. My mother's strong on cleanliness. Food tastes better in a clean house, she always says, and of course there's the livestock I have to care for too. Besides the woodlot, there is two fields down... down down the fairfield road from the tavern and we have to cart it up and we have to cart it up so even if it were better than farming it wasn't all that much fun of course whenever i could i ducked out and did something with jerry sanford if it was hot we'd go for a swim in the mill stream or climb the trees in his woodlot we played a mumble we played mumble the peg or spin the tops or played duck on the rock which i usually won because i could run faster sometimes if it rained we'd go up to tom warups and get him to tell us stories about the indian wars and the brave things his grandfather chief chicken did or if nobody was watching me i'd sneak up into the loft and look at the old almanac sam brought back from college sometimes but mostly i worked i saw betsy read a lot she came into the tavern pretty often to buy thread or clothing or something and i noticed that when she did she'd linger around some um, some excuse and try to listen to what people were saying until mother would say betsy i don't think your mother intended for you to spend all day idling and she'd go i didn't see what difference it made any anyway I never heard anyone say anything important. Then one day in September, she came down with a jug to buy beer. She sat down at the table, and when my mother had her back turned filling the jug, Betsy gave me a wink and jerked her head towards the door. I wrinkled up my forehead 
at her to explain what she meant, but she just nodded at the door again. Then my brother bought the, brought the beer drug back and put it down on the table. Off with you, Betsy, she said. Idle hands make the devil's work. Betsy got up and picked up the beer jug and walked out the door. I forgot to put away the pitchfork, I said. Mother gave me a funny look. When were you using the pitchfork? Did I say pitchfork? I meant the water bucket from when I watered the chickens this morning. I went through the kitchen and outside and then ducked around the corner of the house. When Betsy came out the front door, I gave her a low whistle. She slipped up to the side of the house besides me and gave me a serious look. She wasn't much taller than I, but she was 15, and of course she was smarter than I was. Tim, I have to talk to you about something serious. It was a beautiful sunny day. The birds were twittering, and the breeze was blowing, and you could smell the hay in the field next to us in the wavering heat. The woods shingles on the tavern were warm. It was too nice a day to worry about things. I bent my head and touched my cheek to the warm shingles. It's about Sam. Tim, if he came back to Reading, would you tell your father? I wish Sam would give father back the brown bess. Tim, stop worrying about that. Sam needs a gun. I wish he would, though. Please stop worrying about it. Just tell me what you would do if Sam came back for a visit. Why does Sam want to fight with father? Please, Tim, Betsy said. I have to go. Just answer my question. I still hadn't made up my mind which side I was on in the war. I didn't care whether Sam was a patriot or a Tory or what. All I could think about was snuggling up against him and listening to him talk about scoring telling points. Knowing Sam, I was pretty sure he was trying to score telling points from the other soldiers he was with. I won't tell, I said. Promise? I promise. You swear on the Bible, Tim. I swear on the Bible, I said. When is he coming? I don't know exactly, she said. Soon. He sent me a letter. I was disappointed. He didn't even say when he would come? No, I have to go, Tim. Remember, you promised. But he didn't come soon. At first I thought he would come in a few days, but he didn't. A week passed, and another week, and still he didn't come. When I saw Betsy at the tavern, or in, or in church, I look at her in the hopes that she would give me a sign, or whisper to me that Sam was coming soon, but she never did. I guess she was scared of having the subject come up in front of grown-ups, especially Father or the other Tories. Once, I actually managed to speak to her when she came into the tavern while Mother was in the kitchen getting some bread for some travelers who were eating lunch. "'When's he coming, Betsy?' I whispered. "'When?' "'Shh! Tim!' she hissed. "'Just shush about it!' So I shut up about it, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. I wanted to have Sam there and listen to him talk about the fighting and everything. I wanted to tell him about everything I'd done, too, all the things that would make him proud of me and respect me and like me for finally being able to throw a stone clear over the tavern, which we weren't supposed to do, and about being the best in school at arithmetic. I never used to be very good at anything in school, but for some reason I suddenly got good at arithmetic. So September passed, and then October. The geese flew south in the long, wavering V's. The leaves went red, and then orange, and then brown, and fell so that they crunched when Father and I walked around on them out in the woodlot, where we were getting up the, win the winter's wood. The sky went low, November gray. The puddles grew coats of ice overnight, and one morning when I woke up, the fields were white with snow. That morning, Betsy came down to the tavern with the beer mug, Mother, who was out with the chickens, but father was in the tap room, sharpening the two man saw, because we were going out to the woodlot. Hello, Betsy, father said. How's your family? In good health, sir, she said. I'm glad to hear it. What can I do for you? Beer, is it? Well, help yourself. You know where it is. Thank you, sir, she said. She crossed over to the barrel. Father bent over the saw, the filing making the metal sing as he worked it over the teeth. Tim, are you going to are you going to school this term? Betsy asked. Yes, I said. I looked over to her. We started last month. Then I noticed she was nodding her head slowly up and down. Sam was back. <laughs>